As Krista already mentioned, our scripture lesson this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 1 through 11. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in that same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we wipe off in protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church. Okay. Can you turn Karen back on for a moment? <laughs> Just for a moment. Oh. <laughs> I would like to particularly welcome you here as our full time pastor. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. It is wonderful to be here as your pastor. You're, you're stuck with both Krista and I for the whole year. <laughs> we are both uh, delighted to be here full time now. I, I, I told Brenda a while back it's almost like a weight lifted from your shoulders, you know, to be able to truly be focused here and to be in ministry here sharing with you. So. Thank you for your continued prayers. I want to say just a brief word about the flooding situation uh, just to bring you up to date. Uh, as most of you know, uh, there have been uh, teams going out all across this annual conference, uh, helping out uh, in many, many different ways, uh, providing meals, providing supplies, uh, going in and tearing out uh, things that have been ruined and throwing them out in piles to be hauled off. Much of the work continues and will continue for a long time. And I want to thank this church for your efforts to uh, raise funds. I want to thank you for your efforts to bring in the supplies and much needed things that will help uh, in, in great ways. I also want to say that this is not a short-term fix. One of the things that so often happens is after the initial shock, we tend to forget. But I want to remind you from time to time that there's still lots of work to be done. For many, the rebuilding will soon begin once those houses and churches have dried out and things have been cleansed and disinfected. We're going to need laborers in the field. So if there are persons here who want to use your skills, want to offer your gifts uh, to uh, 
the folks in these flooded areas, it will be greatly appreciated. Just stay in touch with me and I'll try to steer us in the right direction where we can help and uh, serve in ways that will truly make a difference for a lot of people in their lives. So uh, just uh, stay in touch and we'll, we'll work together on that. Now to today's gospel lesson. You know, throughout the gospels, there are scenes like this in which Jesus deploys His followers to share the good news, to make an impact upon the communities in which they live. In this case, here in Luke 10, Jesus sends out 72. These are disciples who have no doubt shown in some way their remarkable love for God, their remarkable gifts in ministry, and a deep desire to share their faith with those around them. And so, if you read this same passage in the New International Version, you discover there that Jesus appoints the 72. That's good United Methodist language, isn't it? <laughs> he appointed the 72 to go out and to advance the gospel. And in many ways, this team of 72 going out two by two works much like an advanced team because they're going into every town and village and place where Jesus intends to visit, preparing the way. Now, as you know from reading this, they're given some very specific instructions on their travel. They're not to take a purse or a bag or uh, anything extra at all with them. In fact, they're even instructed not to speak to anyone along the road. Now, that may seem odd to us in many ways because why wouldn't you want to speak along the road? After all, these are believers. These are people who are being sent out by Christ Himself. Well, perhaps a couple of things we'll say about these instructions just briefly. One of which is, Jesus is saying to His disciples, I want you to truly learn to depend on God. Therefore, you don't need to take a purse or a bag or anything extra that way because God is going to provide for you. You need to learn to trust God in that way. And as for this not speaking to anyone along the road, perhaps Jesus was simply thinking in advance that many of those, if they were spoken to and realized that this team was coming to their town or their community or their village, many of them might run ahead and tell others that these followers of Christ are coming and therefore they put up defenses, they put up guards, not being willing to be open or receptive to the good news of Jesus Christ. And so perhaps that explains why he would have said, don't speak to anyone along the road, because he wanted these people to hear firsthand the good news, and therefore be able to make decisions of their own accord as to what it is they would believe or embrace about Jesus. And one other thing that Jesus says here that's important. He reminds us that the harvest is indeed plentiful, isn't it? There are many people around us who need the Lord. There are many people around us who need our presence, our help, our guidance. And I thank God that in this week, I've seen a lot of people who were giving of themselves, true angels of mercy in these areas that have been hit so hard. But he reminds us that the harvest is plentiful. There are many people who will be receptive to the good news if we're willing to share it. 
The problem is the laborers are few. There aren't enough laborers to go around. There aren't enough people to share the good news. And perhaps that explains in part in this generation why we see dwindling numbers in so many of our churches in all denominations. But let's not forget something here. As believers, as a part of the body of Christ, we are ambassadors of Jesus. And every time we depart from this place or our homes or wherever we are, we are going out there as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. And we should go prepared and equipped to make a difference, to have an impact <clears throat> upon the lives of those that we encounter. <clears throat> Now, many of you have been around me long enough now, even though I was part-time till today. <laughs> um, many of you have been around me long enough to know now that um, I, I strongly believe that all of us are called, all of us are sent out daily to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ, to make a difference in people's lives. There's an old saying that many of you have heard and and often it gets brushed off, but it's one of those sayings that bears a lot of truth, and that is that you may be the only Bible some people ever read. There are people out there watching us, looking at us, because we claim Christ. And they want to see a difference in us. They want to see love, compassion, a caring heart. They want to see people who genuinely care for them. <laughs> so it raises a question, what do others see in us? Do they see the love of Christ? Or do we just blend into the crowd? Just another face in the crowd. What do people see? A few years ago, Jim Griffith and uh, Paul Nickerson came to the district for a uh, workshop, and we held it at the Chief Logan State Park. <coughs> this uh, <coughs> workshop um, <coughs> went all weekend, and <coughs> we concluded on Sunday with a worship service that ended around noon. Now, Jim and Paul had a flight about 5 o'clock, and I was to get them to the airport, and it would take us a little while to get all their gear packed up and loaded up and all this, and they kept asking people, where's a good place we can get a home-cooked meal? Where can we get a good home-cooked meal? After all, we eat fast food on the road all the time. <clears throat> it sure would be nice to sit down to a home-cooked meal. Finally, someone in the crowd said, well, there's a little restaurant in uh, Chapmanville. You can stop there on your way to Charleston. They have home-cooked meals. We got all excited. I was hungry. <laughs> and we stopped in that little restaurant. We, we finally found it, and we stopped there, and uh, <clears throat> we walked into the restaurant, and and the waitress came over to the table and uh, she said, well, I might as well be honest with you. Them Christians ate all the baked steak and the chicken. <laughs> I said, okay, what do you have left? <laughs> we have meatloaf. So we all looked at each other. We said, well, meatloaf it is. <laughs> she came back a little later with our meatloaf <laughs> and uh, a dab of mashed potatoes that was left over, I guess. <laughs> them Christians, you got to watch them. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she struck up a conversation and she said, I hate Sundays. I said, oh. <laughs> So why do you hate Sundays? And she said, because all them Christians come in here and they're so demanding and they don't tip very well. 
and, and she said, I hate Sundays. Uh, we didn't identify ourselves as Christians immediately. <laughs> Now there's wisdom in that, folks. <laughs> so, when we'd finished our meal, we all kind of were chatting there a little bit and we decided we wanted to do something special for this young lady. Maybe something that would brighten her day. Maybe something that would even change her mind about Christians. And so we all pitched in together and came up with a tip for her of about a hundred dollars. And I'm not saying that boastfully. We just wanted to do something nice for her. We left the tip on the table, paid our bill at the front door, and walked out. Never said a word. As we were getting in the car, she came running out of the restaurant. And she thanked us from the depths of her heart. She said, you don't know what this means to me. She said, this means that I'll be able to buy food for my baby this week. And we looked at her and said, we want you to have this and we give it to you in the name of Christ. We never saw her again, never have since, may never. But you see folks, it does make a difference. The way we treat others, the way we live before others makes a huge difference. And I want to encourage all of us to live our lives in such a way that others will, in fact, see Christ living in us. Second, be positive. I know that's tough to do sometimes, but be positive. Others are listening. When you go out of this place, are you saying to others, we had a wonderful service today? Are you saying we had a wonderful time in Christ Jesus? Are you saying that this was truly worth coming to today? Can you say to others, I look forward to getting up on Sunday morning and being in church. Can you say that? Are we able to say good things about the people we worship with every week? The people that we know so well. Now, if someone were to overhear one of your conversations, what would they hear? Think about that for a moment. What would they hear? <clears throat> would they hear words that are <clears throat> uplifting and inspiring? Or would they hear words something like this? Daggone that preacher, he went on too long today and now the Baptists are going to beat us to the restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> or do you know what that music director did? <laughs> Where is he? There he is. <laughs> he picked some hymn we don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> Sounded terrible. <laughs> Why don't he stick with the good old faithful standbys like I'm under the spout where the glory comes out? There's one everyone knows. <laughs> or what about this one? This would never happen here, but I'm just using it as an example. They decided to get new carpet over at the church and they didn't even consult me to see what color it ought to be. <laughs> I'm kidding with you folks, and, and, and you know that, but because none of you would ever say anything like any of this, right? Uh, right? <laughs> or you won't anymore. <laughs> you 
Well, folks, you see, it does make a difference what we say. I know these are silly comments, but the point is simple. If we're going to invite others to be a part of us, if we're going to go ahead and prepare the way so others can receive Christ, then what happens here truly needs to be inspirational. It truly needs to be of the heart. It truly needs to be something that we experience, that we do, in fact, look forward to getting up on Sunday morning and coming to be a part of these services. And what we say beyond these walls ought to reflect that. That we truly do love Christ that we truly do love our church, that we truly do enjoy serving the Master. Anything less could easily negate our very witness. We're sent out every day. We may not realize that, but we are. Every time we go out the doors of our homes, we're sent out. People are watching, people are listening, people want to know about Jesus. And our Lord gives us opportunities daily to make a difference, to have an impact. When I go around these communities right now and see what is happening in these flooded areas, my heart jumps with joy, not because of the loss, the devastation, or any of that, because there are so many people giving of themselves, saying, I want to help you. And they're just jumping in with no expectation of reward. That, to me, is a powerful witness. If those that we encounter see Christ living in us, we will make disciples. And those disciples will make other disciples. And God is going to bless our efforts in wonderful ways. So when we go out from this place today, let others see Christ living in us. And make sure the words we share are uplifting and inspirational to all who hear them. In the name of Christ, amen. We're going to uh, prepare our hearts together around the table of the Lord in just a moment. And as we do so, I want to encourage you as you come to receive communion today, just to take some time to pray and say, Lord, I do love you. I do want to serve you. I do want others to see a powerful witness in me so that they can know that I'm a Christian because of my love. And so as we prepare to gather around the table of the Lord, I want to invite you to take a moment in silence just to pray and say, Lord, Help me to be the person you've called me to be so that when I'm sent out, I'll make a difference. Let's pray. Amen.